In our headlines on this Thursday, November 28th, here in South Korea, weather officials say Seoul and its surrounding area have seen a record amount of snowfall, with road traffic disrupted, air flights grounded, as well as a number of casualties. And the Bank of Korea has lowered its benchmark interest rate by a quarter percentage point yet again to 3% in its first consecutive cuts since the year 2009. Meanwhile, the heads of South Korea and Latvia sat down at the Yongsan presidential office on this Thursday to address bilateral efforts on a number of fronts amid much geopolitical uncertainty. We start here in Seoul and its surrounding area where record snowfall has led to traffic disruptions, flight cancellations and even casualties. Our An Song Jin starts us off. After heavy snowfall swept through South Korea this week, most areas saw the snow ease up in the daytime, though some regions may see snow or rain throughout the evening. Early on Thursday morning, according to the Seoul weather station, snow piled up to 28.6 centimeters in parts of the capital. That's the third largest snowfall Seoul has seen in around a century. Yesterday was the first snow and it was really pretty, so I took a lot of photos. But today, the public transportation was so delayed, I had a hard time commuting. I'm kind of glad it stopped snowing as well, because yesterday was super cold. And I'm glad that the streets are cleared up and we get to walk on dry land. At least three people died due to the snow, including a 60-year-old in Gyeonggi-do province who was removing snow on Thursday morning. Authorities warned of the danger of snow piles collapsing. More than 70 people had to temporarily evacuate their homes due to heavy snowfall, and there were more than 1,000 rescue efforts or reports filed related to snow incidents. Power shortages also affected thousands of households as electricity lines were damaged by falling trees and snow-related issues, especially in Chungcheongnam-do province. And at least 100 flights have been delayed or grounded. Incheon International Airport has warned passengers to pay close attention to their flight schedule for any changes. People have been clearing the snow throughout the entire day and most of the streets in the city have been swept. But as the snow begins to melt and refreeze, pedestrians should watch out for icy patches on the road. The heavy snow warning, which had been issued across Seoul, was lifted as of 10 a.m. Thursday. But some provinces may see snow or rain until Friday. The government and local governments will remain on alert for any further incidents. An Song Jin, Arirang News. Meanwhile, in a largely unexpected move, the Bank of Korea slashed its key rate yet again by 25 basis points to 3 percent while sharing somber economic prospects. Our correspondent Moon Hyeon tells us why. South Korea's central bank has lowered its benchmark interest rate by 25 basis points to 3 percent amid stagnant economic growth. The decision was announced on Thursday following the last Monetary Policy Committee meeting of the year. Although exchange rates have become more volatile, inflation is stable and household debt growth has slowed. However, downward pressure on growth has increased, so the Monetary Policy Committee decided to cut the interest rate further to help reduce these risks. Last month, the BOK implemented a pivot in monetary policy for the first time in over three years, as it slashed the base rate by 25 basis points. The second rate cut in a row comes despite the weakening one against the greenback, following the re-election of former U.S. President Donald Trump, as the BOK focuses on economic conditions here at home. Economic growth in South Korea has been stunted this year, starting off strong with 1.3 percent GDP growth in the first quarter, followed by a 0.2 percent decline in the second quarter. Although the BOK had anticipated a turnaround in the third quarter as a predicted growth of 0.5 percent back in August, recent data show that it only came to 0.1 percent. As a result, the central bank revised its economic growth projections for this year and next year by 0.2 percentage points, from 2.4% to 2.2% for 2024 and from 2.1% to 1.9% for 2025. The BOK attributed the weakened economic growth to a slowdown in export growth and said that export growth is likely to fall short of initial expectations due to intensified competition and a possible rise in global trade protectionism. In an economic slowdown, lowering the interest rate can help boost consumption and investment, as well as reduce burdens on small businesses. 
Analysts say that further rate cuts could come in the near future, but this carries risks. Lower future estimate for growth was the reason for lower interest rate, which means that there are higher possibility now uh, that Bank of Korea will lower the rates. Uh, it may uh, decide to lower the rates faster than it had previously signaled, uh, but there are significant problems to lowering the interest rate. For example, it may strike a bubble in the Seoul housing market. It may increase household and corporate debt even higher. Going forward, the Bank of Korea says it will continue to monitor economic growth and financial stability and thoroughly assess the impact of the rate cut on foreign exchange and other policy variables in order to determine the pace of further cuts in the future. Moon hye Arirang News. At the United Nations in New York, North Korea appears to have unwittingly acknowledged its deployment of troops in support of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Our Kim Jong-shil explains. Toward the end of the UN Security Council meeting, the U.S. representative delivered a pointed question directly challenging Pyongyang. And my last uh, point is just a question to uh, the representative from the DPRK regime. It's a very simple question. Has DPRK deployed troops to Russia? North Korean ambassador to the UN Kim Song neither confirmed nor denied the deployment, instead gave his usual statement that it is a legitimate right for Pyongyang to develop relations with Moscow. The treaty on comprehensive strategic partnership between DPRK and Russian Federation is fully conformed to international law and the UN Charter. Therefore, the DPRK will remain faithful to its obligation under that treaty. Seoul's unification ministry responded on Thursday, stating that regardless of North Korea's indirect acknowledgement, it is evident that North Korean troops have engaged in Russia's war with Ukraine. South Korea, alongside the U.S., the EU and other nations, condemned the deployment as a violation of international law, citing breaches of multiple UNSC resolutions. Seoul also dismissed Pyongyang and Moscow's claims of lawfulness, citing the illegality of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Ukraine's U.N. Ambassador Sergei Kislycha, speaking after the U.S. representative, delivered a sharp rebuke to Kim as well. Out of the need to look in the eyes of the representative of DPRK to tell him directly that he represents a criminal regime and that by the end of the day, sooner or later, you and your leadership will end up in the dock. Ambassador Hwang Jung-guk warned that North Korea-Russia collaboration undermines the U.N. charter-based international order and called for united action to halt their illicit activities. He condemned Russia's partnership with an isolated regime exploiting North Korean troops and redirecting their wages to fund illegal WMD development. Kim Jong-sil, Arirang News. Over in the Middle East, Israel warned displaced people seeking to return home in southern Lebanon from violating a freshly imposed curfew. Our Lee Sing Jae has the latest. As of 4 a.m. Wednesday local time, the 60-day ceasefire agreement between Israel and Hezbollah came into effect. Just over 12 hours later, Israel's Arab spokesperson announced that Israel is imposing a curfew which prevents anyone from Lebanon from entering the south of Lebanon. According to the statement, as of 5 p.m. Wednesday local time, anyone north of the Litani River is prohibited from moving south, while those south of the river must remain where they are. It further warned that the Israeli military is still deployed in southern Lebanon in accordance with the ceasefire agreement and will deal firmly with any movement that violates the agreement. Lebanon also announced on the first day of the ceasefire that it would increase the number of government troops deployed to the south of the country to 10,000. The announcement was made by its defense minister, who said that the increase in troop presence is part of its ceasefire agreement. The troop deployment comes as the ceasefire agreement stipulates that the only forces that can possess weapons during the ceasefire are the government and other regular forces, completely banning Hezbollah from having weapons during the 60 days. With little to no progress being made on a ceasefire agreement in Gaza, U.S. President Joe Biden renewed his push for a deal. Biden took to X on Wednesday to say that the U.S. will make another push for a ceasefire deal in Gaza and for hostages to be released. The leaders of Egypt and Jordan are also working to broker a ceasefire deal between Israel and Hamas. 
Egyptian President Abdul Fattah al-Sisi and King Abdullah II of Jordan met in Cairo on Wednesday to discuss the need for an immediate ceasefire in the enclave. The two leaders also issued a statement praising the ceasefire between Israel and Hezbollah while rejecting the displacement of Palestinians. Meanwhile, after the ceasefire in Lebanon was announced, Hezbollah announced that it's preparing a funeral procession for its slain leader, Hassan Nasrallah. Nasrallah was killed in a massive Israeli airstrike in Beirut in September, which drastically escalated the conflict in the Middle East. Isinje, Arirang News. Here in Seoul on this Thursday, President Yoon Seo-gyal sat down with his Latvian counterpart Edgar Zlinkovici to promote partnership in various fields. According to the top office here, the talks came in light of the Latvian leader's four-day working visit to South Korea. Now on the agenda were ways to boost practical cooperation amid a host of geopolitical uncertainties. And on Wednesday, President Yoon Seo-gyal met with a delegation from Ukraine to address practical response measures to the presence of North Korean troops on the battlefield in support of Russian invasion. Our Oh Soo-young reports. President Yoon Seo-gyal met with a Ukrainian delegation to discuss how to counter the growing military cooperation between Russia and North Korea. According to Yoon's office, the South Korean leader on Wednesday met with the visiting delegation led by Kyiv's Defence Minister Rustam Umarov at the Yongsan Presidential Office. During their talks, Yoon called for Seoul and Kyiv to devise practical and effective strategies to address the threat posed by Moscow and Pyongyang. As Umarov provided an update on Ukraine's war situation and North Korea's troop movements, the Ukrainian minister expressed gratitude for South Korea's support which has provided tangible assistance to the Ukrainian people and expressed hope for strengthening their cooperation in the future. He said the delegation is visiting after President Volodymyr Zelensky ordered him to explore cooperation with South Korea amid Russia and North Korea's military collaboration. The delegation's visit was announced late October following a phone call between Yoon and Zelensky after South Korean intelligence confirmed North Korean troops were being deployed to fight for Russia and Ukraine. The delegation held further talks with National Security Advisor Shin won -sik and Defence Minister Kim jong un to explore further avenues for bilateral cooperation. The two sides agreed to continue intel sharing on North Korea's troop deployments and the regime's arms and technology transfers with the Kremlin. They will also work closely with allied nations to address these issues. The top office did not mention or comment on whether Ukraine had asked for weapon support. However, observers believe artillery and air defense systems may have been requested, as hinted by the Ukrainian president last month, when he said the delegation will soon visit South Korea. So far, South Korea has only provided non-lethal military gear such as bulletproof vests. However, in recent weeks, Seoul has said it will classify weapons into either defensive or offensive categories. It would consider providing defensive weapons first and adjust its response in stages proportionately to developments. Going forward, Seoul will coordinate with Washington on its future decisions regarding the Ukraine war. Yoon's office says as the Biden administration and President-elect Trump's team are responding to the Ukraine crisis as a unified team, South Korea will maintain close communication and cooperation with the US to ensure all decisions are made within the framework of their bilateral cooperation. News. On the local defense front, the Navy has received a new destroyer boasting an advanced interception system that is expected to better protect South Korean skies from North Korean missiles. Our correspondent Kim Bo-kyung reports. Korea's fourth Aegis destroyer, but the first of the next generation, is now operational. The Chongju the Great Destroyer is now in the Korean Navy's hands after being handed over by HD Hyundai Heavy Industries. Named after one of the most revered kings of the Joseon Dynasty, the new destroyer is the first of three 8,200-ton Aegis destroyers that Seoul aims to acquire under the Gwanggyeto 3 Bat 2 project. It was launched in July 2022 and went through hundreds of sea trials before being successfully delivered to the Navy on Wednesday, right on schedule. 
I am very pleased that we are delivering the next generation Aegis destroyer and Jeongju the Great. Based on our technology, experience and the teamwork of Team Korea, we will dedicate ourselves to the export of the K defense industry and K ships. At 170 meters in length, 21 meters wide, and with a full displacement of 8,200 metric tons, the ship has a maximum speed of 30 knots. It has cutting-edge features including a multifunction phased array radar, an integrated sonar system, Korea's vertical launch missile system, and more. The most notable aspect of the Jeongdo the Great Destroyer is that it will be equipped with the latest missile system capable of not just tracking ballistic missiles but also intercepting them. Compared to earlier Aegis destroyers, this warship will be equipped with standard missile 6 ship-based surface-to-air missiles and possibly the SM-3 that are capable of intercepting incoming ballistic missiles. This, the Navy says, makes the destroyer a key asset in Korea's maritime defense system. The Jungjo the Great Destroyer has enhanced capabilities in ballistic missile defense and anti-submarine warfare, making it a key asset in South Korea's maritime-based three-axis defense system to counter North Korea's evolving nuclear, missile and underwater threats. With the delivery to the Korean Navy completed, it will be officially incorporated next month. The second of its class, the Tasan Jongyagyong, will be launched next year while construction of the third began last month. Kim Bo-kyung, Arirang News, Ulsan. Malaysia's top trade official has welcomed the resumption of free trade talks with South Korea while highlighting the importance of supporting small and medium-sized businesses here in the region. Our correspondent Lee Soo-jin sat down with him. On Monday, South Korea and Malaysia established a strategic partnership pledging to strengthen cooperation in various areas including the economy, defense and green energy. Malaysia's Minister of Investment, Trade and Industry was present when President Yoon suk and Malaysian Prime Minister Anwar Ibrahim announced the agreement. We talked to the minister about the economic aspects of the partnership. The next year we'll celebrate 65 years of diplomatic relationships and therefore uh, trade and investment is an integral part of that uh, relationship. We are glad uh, that both parties have agreed to resume um, the Malaysia-Korea FTA. Unfortunately, uh, we had challenges and in 2019 it was stopped, right? And yeah, like you said, last year in March we resumed it. Uh, and during the meeting between the two leaders uh, on Monday, um, they both agreed uh, that we must conclude this. So you mentioned there are also, you know, there's roadblocks as there is to any FTA talks. What are some concerns that need to be addressed before we finalize the agreement? Yeah. Both countries will have industries who are concerned about uh, competition that may not be seen fair. Uh, and I think we have explained to the relevant industries uh, that actually uh, it is not a zero-sum game. We can agree between the two parties, uh, we open up uh, the tariff, more tariff lines or reduce uh, tariff. Uh, because at the end of the day, uh, we feel that it's going to be a win-win. And when asked about regional economic challenges presented by the incoming Trump administration in the U.S., he said this. You're right. Again, um, people are watching closely um, uh, when uh, the U.S. now under Donald Trump. So what do we do in ASEAN? Um, one uh, is that's why we want to focus more on intra-trade within ASEAN as well. ASEAN as an economic block is the fifth largest uh, economic block. Our population is around 680 million. But trade within ASEAN is only 20 to 23 percent. So this, in, in, in this case, you need to include SMEs. I think what you said about intra-trade is very important yes. and you also mentioned the role of SMEs. Yes. Why is the role of SMEs, the Korean SMEs and as well as I'm guessing Malaysian yeah. SMEs, why is that so important? And SMEs is important because even in the region like ASEAN and of course uh, Korea, 90% of companies uh, that are registered are SMEs and if they are not felt uh, then even politically uh, it's going to be difficult uh, to support uh, multilateral agreements or even bilateral agreements. 
And under the theme of inclusivity and sustainability, he said next year's ASEAN summit hosted by Malaysia is expected to boost SME involvement and strengthen supply chain resilience across all Southeast Asia's economies. Lee Soo-jin, Arirang News. This is The World Now, bringing you the latest stories from around the globe. Several of U.S. President-elect Donald Trump's cabinet nominees and administration picks have been targeted with bomb threats and swatting, according to Trump's spokesperson. Carolyn Levitt said in a statement that the threats were made on Tuesday night and Wednesday morning, while the FBI said it was aware of numerous bomb threats and swatting incidents targeting Trump's government nominees. The alleged threats were made to Trump's pick for U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, Elise Stefanik, and the nominee for the head of the Environmental Protection Agency, Lee Zeldin, while Brooke Rollins nominated to lead the Department of Agriculture, as well as Scott Turner and Laurie chavez Derrima, Trump's pick for Department of Housing and Labor Secretary, respectively, posted on social media that they have also received threats. Fox News reported that Defense Secretary nominee Pete Hegseth and Trump's pick for director of the CIA, John Ratcliffe, also received threats. The spokesperson for Trump's transition team added that these appointees were targeted in violent, un-American threats to their lives and those who live with them, while saying that violence will not deter us. Chile's President Gabriel Boric has come under fire after a preliminary investigation was launched regarding a sexual harassment complaint. Chile's Attorney General Christian Crisosto stated that the criminal case was confirmed on Tuesday by the prosecutor's office in Magallanes in the south of the country, where the alleged harassment took place while Boric was a lawmaker in the region. The youngest president in Chile's history, 38-year-old Boric, allegedly sexually harassed a woman in 2013 by sending dozens of non-consensual emails, including one where he sent explicit images that were not requested or consented to when he was living in the city of Punta Arenas. President Boric denied the allegations through his lawyer, who said that the president is the victim of a situation of systematic harassment. The Indian Coast Guard reported a record seizure of 5.5 metric tons of methamphetamine from a Myanmar-operated fishing boat in the Andaman Sea on Tuesday. Six Myanmarese citizens were arrested in the bust, which the Indian Coast Guard stated was the biggest ever drug haul by the authority. The Indian Coast Guard's reconnaissance party found a suspicious small fishing boat carrying a Myanmar flag and alerted the authorities, which shadowed the small vessel until arrests were made early Monday. The Andaman and Nicobar Islands Director General of Police said that the market value of the seized drugs would be some four billion U.S. dollars. Ukrainian free diver Katarina Sadurska has set a new world record in the no-fins discipline of the sport. 32-year-old Sadurska dived 82 meters in 3 minutes and 10 seconds off the coast of Dominica on Tuesday, breaking her own previous world record of 80 meters. Now it marks her sixth world record in free diving to date. She said that her training was not easy, as she could not train in a war-torn home country, but said that she is really happy to do this dive. Kim Xiang, Arirang News. In many places, snow has piled up over 40 centimeters, which is as high as knee level. There will be no more worries about heavy snow. However, rain and snow will continue in most areas by tomorrow. Most of the snowfall has weakened now, but heavy snow warnings are still in place in some areas. There will be up to 15 centimeters of more snow on Jeju Island, up to 10 centimeters in southwestern parts of Gangwon-do province, and up to 8 centimeters in southern Gyeonggi-do province and northern parts of Chungcheongbuk-do province today. Snow in the Seoul metropolitan area and western parts of Gangwon-do province will mostly stop tonight. It will snow from tomorrow afternoon to tomorrow night, but the snowfall will be up to 5 centimeters. Tomorrow, icy roads can be seen in the morning in most parts of the country. Seoul starts at minus 4 degrees, Daejeon at minus 3. Highs will move up to 4 in Seoul, Daegu and Gyeongju, 8 degrees. Cold spells will continue across the country. That's all for Korea. Here are the weather conditions around the world.
Those are the headlines at this hour here in South Korea. Coming up next is our daily panel session. Do stay with us. Thank you for now.